What is up, everybody? Welcome to Red Rocks Church Young Adults. I want to wish everybody a happy Thursday night. My name is Connor, and I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Young Adults. And for everybody tuning in, I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Um, to all of our young adult OGs that have been coming for a while, I want to say that I miss you guys. I miss seeing your faces. I miss hanging out on Thursday nights. And hopefully someday soon we'll be able to resume that. Fingers crossed. But until then, thanks so much for coming, for showing up, for hanging out with us online. And for every single person who is tuning in where it might be your first time checking us out, I want to say thanks for uh, taking that step. I know that coming to a church or listening to a sermon or even tuning in online for the very first time can be a big step of faith and can really maybe stretch you. And so I wanted to say thanks for taking that step and for putting yourself out there and for being a part of our community. Um, we love you and we're grateful that you're here. You're going to find out really quick that here at YA, we are obsessed with a man named Jesus. Jesus has actually transformed my life. He has made me a complete and totally different person. And it is my honor to get to follow Jesus and learn from Jesus and serve him the rest of my life. And so I know that there's probably this reality that a lot of you tuning in tonight might not share that same perspective on Jesus that I have, and that's totally okay. I want to let you know that you're welcome here. You don't have to believe everything that you hear to belong. But tonight, and especially tonight, I would like to ask you if you would open up your heart and maybe consider the possibility of the reality of who Jesus is and what he has to say about a very important subject and topic and cultural issue that I want to talk about tonight. Um, if I'm being completely honest with you, I had a completely different message written up for tonight. I, uh, I had a message where I just kind of thought it could be something that you all would enjoy hearing, have a couple of jokes, be a little timely. But honestly, the more I thought about it and the more I prayed, um, I felt like to really speak to what's going on in our culture and to really speak to what's going on in our communities and our, our world, our nation. The message that I had planned just seemed cold and out of touch and a little insensitive. And so I decided to change what I wanted to speak about. And if I'm being totally honest, it would be very easy for me to ignore the blatant cries of pain and the blatant cries for justice that we're seeing in our black communities today all across our world. It would have been easy for me um, to feel afraid to say the wrong things, uh, and I still might do that. It'd be easy to uh, be afraid of offending somebody um, with something that I say um, when it comes to speaking on this and moving on with life as normal. Um, it would be easy, but I genuinely felt convicted by the Holy Spirit that it would also be sinful it would be privileged and it would be wrong to not use my voice to speak on what we see going in happening in our society today. And so tonight for the next few moments, I want to take the next couple moments to speak on a subject that I've titled God's heart for justice and racial diversity. God's heart for justice and racial diversity. Now I want to start off by saying that I am very aware of my limitations when it comes to the topic of racism and racial prejudice and racial injustice, let me start off tonight by stating a very obvious fact. I am a white man. I'm a white man. And like anybody else in this world, I had no choice when it came to picking my race, picking my skin color, picking my gender or my ethnicity. However, I'm also aware that as a white man in this country, I am afforded privileges um, that many of my black and uh, brothers and sisters will never get to experience in this life because of my race, because of my skin color, because of my gender. I get an opportunity to experience life in a different way than most of the black community does. And I believe that with the privilege that I have been afforded, I also have a responsibility, not just as a man, not just as a white man, but as a follower of Jesus and as a pastor, 
to speak on anything that is a gospel-centered issue. And please believe me that the issue of race and injustice is not just a social or political issue. At the very heart of this issue is a gospel issue. Now, I cannot tell you firsthand what it feels like to experience racism or to be racially profiled. Um, and I'm not even going to pretend for a second to step into that realm of the pain or the weight of a feeling like my skin color might dictate what my experience in this life is. I'm not going to even pretend like I know what that feels like. But here's what I do know, and here's what I'm going to share about. I know God's heart towards the issue. I do know that when Jesus came into this world, I can't start crying already. <clears throat> when Jesus came into this world, the gospel that he brought, bringing the kingdom of God, inaugurating the kingdom of God from heaven to earth, when he brought that into this world, there was not a single social, a single ethical, or a single racial stone that Jesus left unturned. So tonight, I want to speak about God's heart for justice and racial diversity. And tonight, I'm going to ask you to be extra gracious with me. I'm going to beg you to give me more grace than you have probably ever given me before in your life. Because here's the reality. There's a chance that tonight, I'm going to say something that offends somebody totally by mistake. And there's a chance tonight, and my hope is that I say something that might offend somebody in the right way, that might push somebody towards action and movement when it comes to this area where maybe you've been apathetic before. But there's a chance that I might say something wrong. And if I do, I want to ask you to give me grace ahead of time for that. And I also want to be clear that I am not even going to come close to saying everything that needs to be said when it comes to the issue of race, racism, and racial injustice in our world and how Jesus feels about it. But over the next couple moments, um, I just want to ask us if we can posture our hearts to receive from Jesus his heart towards this issue of justice and racial diversity in our world. And so we're going to pray, and then we're going to jump in. Father God, tonight, I believe that we need you more than ever. I believe that when we turn on our phones, look at our social media, turn on our TVs, you cannot ignore the cry of the broken and the hurting in our country and in our world. You can't ignore the weight that people that you have created and designed beautifully in your image are oppressed and being mistreated based on the color of their skin. Jesus, this is an issue that no politician, no social group can solve. We need you. We need your spirit. Father God, we need your love and your peace to come and break through our hardened hearts, to see people the way that you see them, to fight injustice whenever we see it, and to restore equality that the kingdom of God came to bring every single person, black or white, regardless of color. And so, so tonight, Jesus, here's my prayer that you would open our hearts. Help us to see ourselves the way that you see us. Help us to see others the way that you see them. And God, would you do a miracle and transform our life and our perspective tonight when it comes to the issue of justice and race and diversity? Father, we love you, and we know that it's only you that can save and bring healing. And so we ask you to do what only you can do tonight. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. And everybody online said Amen and amen. I want to focus our attention tonight on a smaller book in the Old Testament. It's a minor prophet, a book by the name of Amos. And we're going to look specifically at Amos chapter 5. But I want to set the scene for what's happening before we dive into this pretty well-known little section of Scripture, because I believe that what we're about to read in Amos chapter 5 actually is so relevant to our current cultural climate and the situations and the problems and the injustice that we face today. Amos was a shepherd, actually. He was a shepherd and a farmer, and he lived right on the border of uh, southern Judah and northern Israel. 
and he was called to be a prophet of God during the time of the reign of King Jeroboam II. Now, King Jeroboam was a militant king. He actually brought Israel to a place of great success and great wealth. He was a conqueror. He conquered many other nations, and he brought a ton of wealth and prosperity to the nation of Israel. However, all of the prophets saw King Jeroboam II as a wicked king. Now, Amos, he arrives on the scene, And he accuses Israel and their leaders of extreme injustice that breaks the heart of God. He accuses the wealthy and the privileged of the nation of Israel of ignoring the cry of the oppressed and the poor and the hurting in their community. Now, more specifically, what was happening in this situation uh, in the book of Amos was the poor in the community. When the nation of Israel conquered other nations, the nation itself would grow in prosperity, but there would become a greater divide between the wealthy and the powerful and the elite and the privileged and the poor and the oppressed and the hurting. And so what was happening at this time in Amos's time was that the poor, because they did not have money to live life and pay off debt, they were actually being sold into slavery. And the poor and the oppressed, when they were being sold into slavery, actually began to find that they were being denied fair legal representation in the country and the nation of Israel. Sounds pretty familiar if you're being honest with yourself. And so these people, these poor and these oppressed people were being sold into slavery and they were being denied legal representation by their own brothers and sisters in their own community. And what broke the heart of God most was that Israel saw all of this happening before them, but continued on as if life was totally and completely normal. Now listen, those who are privileged and unaffected by the oppression, they heard uh, the injustice and they heard the cries of the hurting and they continued on with life as if nothing wrong was happening. The Bible says in Amos that they continued with all their religious gatherings. They continued offering sacrifices and engaging in religious practices. They continued in their worship routines and singing their songs. They continued with life as normal, all while ignoring the cry of people in their own backyard, people that they actually might have owned, human beings being sold as property and misrepresented legally but they continued to come to church. They continued to clap their hands. They continued to give in the offering buckets. They continued as if no injustice was happening. And I want you to hear something, young adults, in response to the injustice that God saw in Israel and the apathy he saw of his people towards this injustice. Here was what God's response was. Amos chapter five, We're going to start in verse 21 and go through 24, and I'm going to read out of the message version. It says this. This is God speaking. He says, I cannot stand your religious meetings. And listen, I'm fed up with your conferences and your conventions. I want absolutely nothing to do with your religious projects, your pretentious slogans, and all of your church goals. I'm so sick of your fundraising schemes, your public relations and image marketing. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. I want to ask you a question. When was the last time you actually sang a song to me? This is what God says towards the issue of injustice. He says this, do you know what I want? Do you know what the heart of God wants? He says, I want justice and I want oceans of it. I want fairness or righteousness and I want rivers of it to flow. That is what I want. And God said, that is all that I want. God, through the prophet Amos, he addresses his people and he says, listen, you can continue to engage in all your religious church activity. You can continue to act spiritual. You can continue to do your devos and read your books. You can continue to listen to your worship albums and sing songs. You can continue to do life as normal. 
But as long as there is injustice crying out from the streets and you continue to turn a blind eye to it, you can participate in all your religious activity that you want, but just know something. I'm not going to be in it with you. You can do life as normal, but I'm not going to be in it until injustice is dealt with and righteousness and fairness flows like a river. Think about that. I want you to think about that for a moment. God is telling his people, when you see injustice, when you see oppression, when you see racism, even if you are unaffected, it should change your normal. It should change your life. It should change your normal routine, your normal habits. And there should be something that rises up inside of you and says, I cannot continue with life as normal until this injustice is dealt with in my community. Why I genuinely believe from the bottom of my heart that we are standing in a pivotal moment in history, much like the nation of Israel and the prophet Amos in this book. I believe that we as a church, not just as individuals, but as a church, as a large church, the body of Jesus Christ nationally and globally, I believe we are at a moment in history and a moment in time that will define the next couple decades of our relations with our black community and our black brothers and sisters. It's not that injustice or racism or racial, racial prejudice is new on the scene. No, this has been going on for hundreds of years. But because of technology and iPhones and all these different things, we now have the ability to capture the reality that our black community faces on a daily basis and calls a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, whatever. We now have the opportunity to see what their reality is actually like in our country. There is an entire race of God's children crying out in pain, desiring what God wants, desiring what the heart of God wants, which is oceans of justice and rivers of fairness and righteousness. And church, I believe from the bottom of my heart, we are at that moment in history. We are at that defining moment as a church, as a large, where we are at a fork in the road. And I believe as followers of Jesus, we have an option. We have one of two decisions that we can make as people to claim that claim to follow Jesus and follow God with their life. Number one, do we as followers of Jesus respond to the cry of the hurting in our communities, even if it's inconvenient, even if it's messy, even if we might not have the ability to solve the problem, or even if we might not have all the right things to say in the moment or all the answers to all the questions or the problems that we see? Do we as a church, do we as a people that say that we will follow Jesus no matter what? Do we respond to the issues that we see? Do we respond to our black community's cries of pain and hurt and injustice? Or do we live life as normal, going about our business, going about our religious duties and our religious obligations? Do we live life as normal until one day the social media posts calm down and the awareness begins to fade until the next victim of injustice occurs? Do we listen to the cry of those that are treated unfairly? Do we seek justice in a flawed and broken system? Do we respond and fight alongside those who are hurting in our churches, in our communities, in our cities? Or do we go on as life as usual, hoping that we don't have to get touched by the inconvenience of somebody else's pain? Man, I pray from the bottom of my heart that we as a church can agree on what the answer to that question should be. I pray that we know without a shadow of a doubt our response to this issue. I've heard people ask this question when it comes to the discussion of racism and injustice as Christians and as a church. I've heard it asked if God so desperately wants justice, if God so desperately wants oceans of justice and rivers of fairness, then why doesn't God just do it? 
He's God, right? Why doesn't God just bring justice and bring righteousness? Why doesn't God just do what he wants, right? And I think that's a fair question to ask. I think that's a reasonable question. When, when you hear God say, I want oceans of justice, initially it sounds like God is saying, listen, I really have a desire in my heart for things to be right. I really have a desire as God. I have a desire in my heart for things to be right. I really wish there was justice. I really wish there was fairness as God. That is what I wish. But I want you to remember as we read in Amos 5 that God in this passage is not just expressing what he wants to happen in an overall sense. God is expressing what he wants from his people. God is not just saying, this is what my heart as God wishes would happen. God is saying, this is what I'm calling on the people that follow me to do. This is what I want from my people. It's interesting in this passage in Amos 5, the original um, Hebrew word for justice in this passage is mispot or mispot. Pot. I'm, I might pronounce, um, uh, wow, mispronounce it, um, but it's mispot or mispot. And get this, it literally means this. It means action taken to correct injustice. It's action that is taken to correct injustice. It's not just God saying, I desire for justice to be had. I desire, I wish that there was justice. No, God is saying, I want action taken that brings oceans of justice to your community and oceans of justice to those that are hurting and broken and crying out in pain. When you see injustice, what I want God is saying from you is to bring actions that bring oceans of justice to that situation. Jesus even said in Isaiah 61, this is why I have come to mend the brokenhearted, to lift the head of the weary. When Jesus in Luke reads the passage of the messianic Messiah of, of the one coming for Israel, he said, this is why I've come. Justice isn't just this metaphorical potential for things to be right. This word in the Hebrew means actions that are taken to make things right when we see injustice in our world. And in uh, the original text, when it says that uh, I want rivers of righteousness, the, the uh, message version translates that word as fairness, but the word for righteousness in the original Hebrew language is actually tzedakah. And it means this, it means right and equitable relationships between people, no matter their differences. Man, Amos is preaching to our culture right now. Like the Hebrew word for righteousness, when God says, I want rivers of righteousness to flow, he's saying, I want rivers of right and equitable relationships between people to be healed, regardless of the differences that you see in somebody else. That is what I want. The word translated righteousness in this passage is literally addressing the chasm between the privileged and the wealthy and the poor and the hurting in Amos's day in the nation of Israel. God is telling Israel, listen, do you know what I really want from you? Do you know what I really want from the people that say that they follow me, from the people that call on my name? Do you know what I want from you? I want oceans of action taken to correct injustice and eradicate it in your world. I want rivers of equity and transform relationships flowing out of my church, no matter the differences in skin color, race, gender, or ethnicity that you see. This is what I want. I want healed relationships, and I want action taken to heal those relationships. And I just wonder... As young adults in 2020, I wonder if you can hear what the Spirit of God is saying to our church today. Can you hear the current and the wind that the Spirit is blowing in our churches and blowing in our nation? Young adults, listen, I honestly believe that God is telling us as a church, the church in 2020, 
with the horrific injustices that we see on our news feeds and our Instagram feeds every single day. I feel like this is what God is speaking to us. He's saying, listen, I want your worship. I love it when you come together and you worship me. I love your devotion. I want you to follow me with every single thing that you have. I love when you praise me. I love when you read your word. I love when you come together with friends and talk about what I'm doing in your life. I love all of that and I want all of that for you because that brings me glory. But I also want you to act when you see injustice. When you see injustice, when you see racism, when you see injustice being done to other people and they are crying out for help, I want you to take oceans worth of action towards fighting injustice. And I want you to fight for people that are oppressed and hurting, especially those who are different than you. That is what I believe the spirit of God is speaking to our church right now. And in the midst of some of the greatest racial tension that I've ever witnessed in my lifetime, I believe that God is calling all of us as young adults to be bold enough to step up and to take action, to stand with those that are hurting and to bring the oceans and the rivers of healing, to reconcile relationships and bring justice to our black communities when they are screaming at the top of their lungs that there is not the same justice that we get to experience that they have in their everyday life. It is our job as followers of Jesus to step into that pain and to step into that tension and to step into that moment and maybe lift some hands when they're tired of lifting, maybe lift our voices because our black community's voices have grown tired of screaming the same thing for generations and generations and generations. It's time for our church to recognize the gospel of justice and racial diversity and racial interracial relations. Jesus is in the heart of the pain. Jesus is in the middle of it all. Jesus is in the heart of the cries. He's in the middle of the cries of those who are being oppressed and pushed down and experiencing injustice. And he is asking his church, would you please step forward and take action? And would you fight to reconcile relationships with those, even if they're different from you? God's saying, when you follow me and you really follow me, when you have experienced an encounter with me and you have really encountered me, when you have a relationship with me and you're willing to walk with me wherever I lead you, man, it'll transform your heart for people. It'll transform your heart for others. It'll transform your passion and your compassion and your empathy for those that don't look like you, don't act like you, don't come from the same genealogies as you. It'll transform everything about you. And you will have a heart to fight for hurting and broken people. You will love others who are different than you. And I believe that it is beautiful that God made us that way, that God made us different. Band, you guys can come on up. But I think that it's beautiful that God made us all different, that he didn't make all of us the same. Like, can we not forget, can we recognize for a moment that it was God who makes skin color? It was God that decided every single shade of skin color that exists on this planet. It was God that determined what your culture is. It was God that determined your race, your race and your ethnicity. It was God that determined your ancestry line and where you would come from and the generations of people before you. That was not a mistake. That was God's choosing. And can we, can we pretend, can we, can we recognize for a minute and stop pretending that, that, that we somehow have to manage this diversity? Like it was God's idea to give us differences, to give us diversity in the first place. It was God's gift to us as the human race to be different to learn from one another, to experience, the to experience the image of God himself, not just on me, but in us. 
in, in white communities and black communities and Mexican communities and whatever. The image of God is not just something I carry. It is something that we carry together as a community. God made us different and it is beautiful and it is intentional and it is on purpose. I believe genuinely at its core, racism is just tribalism based off of fear of differences. That racism at at its heart, uh, people that are racist are afraid. They're afraid of the things that make us different and they can't confront that. And so it's easier to be with what you're familiar with than challenge yourself to be with someone who is different than you. And I believe that when it comes to the movements and the cries that we see in our black communities, there is a narrative that's going around, and it's this, that the cure for racism and the cure for racial prejudice and racial injustice is just to not see or recognize race, color, or cultural differences anymore. There's a narrative going around um, our country and our culture, and I think to some degree it's well intended, but I think it's so misinformed that the cure for racism and the cure for injustice when it comes to our black community is that if we as non-black people can just stop seeing color, if we can stop seeing culture, if we can stop seeing differences, then that will cure our racist problem. And I want to say that that couldn't be further from the truth because justice and healing is not colorblind. Justice and healing is not, the goal is not to eliminate our differences. The goal is not to eliminate what makes us individuals and what makes us unique. That would be robbing us of the uniqueness and the gift that God created each of us to be as individuals and each of us to be as races and ethnicities. And we can't do that. That's not the answer. Racism at its core is a fear of diversity and differences, and I believe that it manifests itself in two different ways. Number one, and this is the one we primarily see on the news and and on our social media accounts is this, it looks to dominate and rule over those with differences due to fear or lack of understanding. Racism, when when you're faced with a difference in skin color, a difference in culture, one of the manifestations of racism, which is the most common one that I believe we see, is this, this tendency to try to dominate and take over and control something due to fear or lack of understanding. But racism manifests itself in another way. It also will look to minimize or underplay the importance of our differences and the value that our differences give us and act like they don't exist. If we can't overpower and if we can't dominate the thing we're afraid of, then what we'll look to do is to minimize it and underplay it so that it loses its power and it loses its hold. And I believe that there's a narrative in our culture that if we can just pretend like differences don't exist, then there will be no racism anymore. But can I tell you, that is a form of racism in and of itself because we are different. Differences are real. Both of these options rob us. The image of God is not just on a single race, a single ethnicity. Both uh, men and women, black and white, Mexican, whatever, every nation, every color, together we make the image of God and have so much to learn from one another about what it's like to follow Jesus in this world. God's kingdom, God's way, when it comes to dealing with injustice and racial prejudice, isn't to fear diversity, isn't to run from it or look to dominate it or underplay it. It's actually to celebrate diversity, to celebrate our differences, because all of us together, we know as Christians, make up the image of God. God's kingdom recognizes when when Jesus came to bring the gospel and to reconcile everything from sin to race to everything in between. The kingdom of God recognizes that it might take a little effort. It might take a little work. It might take conversations. It might take saying the wrong thing sometime. It might take having to sit down and talk about it. It might take extending grace But the kingdom of God recognizes that our differences are worth it. Our differences are worth it. What makes us different is supposed to be celebrated in God's kingdom. It's supposed to show us more about God's heart, show us more about God's character, show us more about God's culture, what he's like. Our differences were made to be celebrated. 
and everything the cross of Jesus Christ has done, not just for me, but for all of us, brings us all different race, different color, different ethnicity into the same family. That's the beauty of the kingdom of God. It's that it's not just a community of white people or black people. It's all of us who've called on the name of Jesus to be our savior. All of us who've recognized our sin. All of us who know that we can't go a single day and live a way that pleases God. And so we need Jesus. And within Jesus's family, there is room for black, for white, for whatever color you can imagine, there is room. I want to end tonight with this picture because I think that it so adequately expresses the heart of Jesus when it comes to diversity and what his plan is and what his goal is from the very beginning to the end. I'm going to read out of the book of Revelation. It was written by a guy named John. He was uh, exiled on an island called Patmos, and he had a prophetic vision into the future. And uh, he saw these images of what it's going to look like when God's kingdom comes to earth. And there's a new heaven and there's a new earth and a new Jerusalem where all people are going to dwell. And I want you to hear some things that he sees in this revelation of what God's kingdom is like, what heaven is going to be like. Revelation 7, uh, 9 through 10, it says this. He says, after this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that nobody could count. And get this from every nation every tribe, every people, and every language. They were standing before the throne and before the lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. John, in his revelation of heaven, in the throne room of Jesus, he recognizes. Uh, listen, I can't guarantee you what heaven's going to be like. I've never been there. I, all I can tell you is when I was a younger kid and I first became a Christian, I thought when we got to heaven, we were all white people with blue eyes and blonde hair and had wings. And I remember the day, no lie, that I read this passage and I was like, oh my gosh. From John's understanding, from what he saw, he recognized difference. He recognized different nations. He recognized different tribes. People apparently were speaking different languages. There was difference that made up the people and the community of God in heaven, in perfection, in the presence of Jesus. Revelation chapter 21, verses 20 through 24 in the message say this. This is talking about the very end. When there's a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, John said he saw this. He said, there was no sign of a temple for the Lord God, the sovereign and strong one and the lamb, they're the temple. The city doesn't need sun or moon for light and God's glory is the light and the lamb is the lamp. The nations, the nations, plural, not a nation, not a people, the nations, will walk in its light and the earth's kings bring their splendor. Its gates will never be shut by day and there won't be any night. They'll bring glory and honor of the nations into the city. Nothing dirty or defiled will get into the city and no one who defiles or deceives, only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life will get in. Think about this. God gives John the privilege of seeing into the throne of heaven, of seeing what the reality of life is going to be when Jesus comes back to establish his kingdom, not only in heaven, but on earth. And John, in this vision, recognizes difference among people. Man, God gave us differences as a gift to be known and to experience him through. Jesus, he has such a heart to heal and restore and reconcile injustice in our world, to celebrate how beautifully, amazingly different he made us, displaying the image of God in every single person that has breath. And I believe that he's looking for a church and looking for a group of young adults who will say, okay, God, I know it might be hard. I know I might not even know where to start, I know that I might not experience the same pain, the same discrimination, the same racism, the same problems. I know that on a practical level, I might not be able to relate to my hurting brothers and sisters. But here's what I do know. I want your heart. 
And God, if your heart is to bring justice where there is injustice, and if your heart is to reconcile relationships between people that are oppressed and people that are different, then God, that is my heart too. That is my heart. Jesus, your passion will be my passion. Your purpose will be my purpose. Your ways will be my ways. They have to be. If we say that we follow him, we have to follow him all the way, even if it's inconvenient, even if it's in the territory we've never gone to before. We have to follow Jesus wherever he leads. Tonight, as I wrap up, I wanna pray. And there's a few different groups um, that I wanna pray for. Tonight, if you feel uh, compelled to follow Jesus into the mess that our culture is in, tonight, maybe it's never dawned on you that just because racism doesn't affect you directly, it affects your loved ones, the people that are in this church, the people that God calls to be our family and our friends. Maybe tonight, out of pure ignorance, nothing evil in your heart, maybe tonight you didn't know that God wants you to fight injustice when you see injustice. I want you right now as you're looking in your screen, I want you to lift your hand. I know it might feel weird. I know it might feel uncomfortable. Um, but I believe that there are people that are gonna hear this tonight and for the very first time realize I might not have the answers, but I have a role to play in bringing justice to our world and bringing justice to our black community. I have a role to play in following Jesus to bring justice, even if it hurts, even if it's di difficult, even if I don't understand everything. I want to step into this moment with God. I want to step into the gospel of reconciliation. And I want to take a stand. And I want to bring God's purposes and his passions to my community and my city and my world. If that's you, could you just raise your hand? I'm going to pray for you in a moment. And tonight, I want to pray for those who are sitting at their screens and have experienced racism firsthand. Tonight, I want to pray for you. If you have been looked down upon or treated differently because the, the color of your skin, can I tell you that that is a symptom of hell? And that is not something that pleases the heart of God and it breaks his heart. And I was talking to some friends earlier and I, I can't even believe, I've never even had this thought, but they were just like, listen, there are moments in my life where sometimes I pray and I'm just like, God, why did you make me black? Why did you make me this way? Life would be so easier if I just didn't have to be the way I am. And listen, that only comes from somebody who has experienced generations. That, 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 that thought only comes from someone who's experienced generations of injustice and racism. And so tonight, if you're looking at your screen and you are a victim of racism, if you have been racially profiled, if you have been belittled or thought less of or spoken ill of because of the color of your skin, would you raise your hand? I'm going to pray for you. And listen, I can't make any guarantees and my prayers probably hold very little power. But here's what I do know where there's pain and where there's hurt. Jesus is there. The Holy Spirit is there. And God is the only one who can heal that pain. Jesus and his good news is the only one that can reach into the darkest depths of our soul where we've been wounded the most and bring healing. So I'm going to pray and we're going to go into a moment of worship. Father God, I pray right now that every single person under the sound of my voice would experience your love and your fierce desire for justice and your fierce desire for righteousness and healing and fairness. God, I pray for every single person under the sound of my voice that has maybe not realized that they have a role to play. Maybe we feel like Israel where our life is fine. Our life is great. We have the wealth. We have the privilege. We have the success. And we've kind of carried on our life as if everything was normal. When we have a whole community crying out that life isn't normal for them that injustice is a reality for them. And so God, I pray that tonight for those, would you speak to the hearts of those people who it's time to step up and play their part, to use their voice, to use their platform, to use their privilege, to say enough is enough.
to take up your heart, God, of bringing oceans of justice and rivers of mercy to our hurt and broken world. And God, I pray tonight for those in our community and those all across our country and our world that have faced discrimination and racism because of the color of their skin. God, I pray tonight that you would bring healing to depths that I can't even fathom. Would you bring healing and peace, not just peace that, that, that quenches a feeling in a moment, he, peace that restores the soul, healing that not just brings inner healing, but brings healing to our land that rights the problem. God, I pray for anyone that has faced racism, that you would mourn with them, that you would cry with them, that you would let them know that it is okay to be frustrated and angry because it is not right. And God, would your Holy Spirit bring healing in ways that only you know how to do? Would your gospel be once again good news to those who have been pushed to the sides and oppressed and looked down upon? that God does not see them that way, but that they were uniquely and specifically designed exactly the way that they are to be the person that you have made them to be, to carry the mantle and anointing and the call that our black community has on them to bring the good news of Jesus to everyone in this world. Jesus, we love you. And we know that it's only you that can change a heart and change a culture and change a nation. And so, God, we are crying out to you as we take up the mantle to do our part. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody tonight said, amen. Young adults, I love you. Let's worship together tonight.